Hello and welcome to the Horticulturalists. I'm Stephen Ryan. And I'm Matthew Lucas. And we post a video every Friday. So why not hit subscribe and the alert button so that you'll know when our next video comes up. And if you have a burning horticultural question for Stephen Ryan, put it in the comments below and we will try and answer it. He will try and answer it in 60 seconds every Monday and do say where you're from. Yes, because I do need the context. It helps a lot. You do. Yes, and speaking of... Context. Yes. Firstly, the magnolia behind us. <laughs> but Stephen. Yes, that's not why we're here. I was going to say, we are not here, much as I'd love to, to yeah. talk about magnolias. Yeah, well, that may be a story for the future, though. Yes. Yes, there's definitely a story in that group of plants. But no, this morning we are at a uh, nursery, a commercial nursery, mm -hmm. open to the public in the Dandenong Ranges at Alinda, called Gentiana Nursery. And we're here to look at um, Craig Wilson's private collection of plants. This isn't things that he sells, mm -hmm. but it's his personal private passion that we're here to engage with. And they are? Bonsai trees. Oh, Stephen, you know my feelings about bonsai. Yeah. Which Part of is... the reason why you're here, in <laughs> fact, because we're, we're doing a bit of conversion therapy today. No, it's illegal, it's <laughs> illegal. Not about bonsai, it's not. Oh, okay. Well, look, I am very happy to meet Craig and get him to talk us through, I guess, bonsai from A to Z. Yeah, look, I think it's one of those uh, areas of horticulture mm. that people... That either, I've avoided. Yeah, well, you've avoided. But people either engage with it and become obsessed with it mm. and love it mm. and spend the rest of their lives doing it, mm. which a lot of people do. Mm. And others are timidly in the background, not oh. sure what... It, oh, no. I'm not even timidly in the background. No, no, you're, you're, I'm waving my flag. Yeah, well, <laughs> but there's lots of people out there that would love to have a crack at it and yeah. understand it and, and do it properly, but are just scared to sort of make that leap into growing things mm. as bonsais mm. and I think the whole thing is fairly practical and, and obvious when it's sorted out and put in front of you and that's hopefully what we'll do today. I think too one of the things for me is that it seems from a distance really fiddly and I'm not a fiddly kind of gardener yeah. you know I just like things yeah. Yeah, you, would, you wouldn't paint with a paintbrush, you'd paint with a uh, four inch A roller. Yeah, yeah, a roller, yes. Uh, <laughs> so I guess that's one of my things about, you know, low maintenance versus high maintenance and all the, the esoteric knowledge involved. Mm -hmm. But you know what? We should just go and talk to Craig. I think that's a fabulous idea. Let's go and find him and we'll all learn lots today. Well, I will. All right. Well, here we are. And Craig, thank you so much for having us in your nursery. So Craig Wilson, everybody who haven't, hasn't met him yet. And we're at Gentiana Nursery at Alinda. And our topic, as we've mentioned today, is going to be all about bonsai. Oh. Yes. <laughs> Maybe he's still cringing. You'll, 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 get, you'll get over it in due course. No, secret confession though. I did come to Gentiana maybe about a year ago. Yeah. And Craig did take me aside and said, you've got to come and see bonsai. Yeah. They're yeah. beautiful. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So let's start off where we should start off though when we're talking about bonsai. And at the his, beginning. Yeah, at the beginning. Yeah. As Julie Andrews said. Yeah. So obviously everybody's aware it's an Asian art, but just how far in Asia does bonsai cover and does it vary in the different countries? It, it definitely varies. Yeah. I mean, it, it's difficult for me to explain, but I if I see a tree, I will know whether it's Vietnamese, Taiwanese, Indonesian, Japanese or Chinese, just from the style. Really? And with the pot that it's in, but the difference is like, it's something that's hard to put down to. Yeah, so it's sort of an esoteric thing it's that an esoteric the thing. know all about. So I was yeah. going to say, I, I would have perhaps thought there was quite a difference, say, between Chinese and Japanese. Absolutely. Chinese call it penjing. Mm. Yeah, and, and they are inclined to be a bit more relaxed in their styling than that the Japanese. more like me. Yeah. yeah. They, they, they often do sort of the little forest setting thing, yeah. don't they, where there, there's actually several trees in the same container to look like a little miniature forest. The Japanese do groups. Yeah. Absolutely yeah. they do. But the, the Chinese, they're more inclined to decorate. Yeah. They, they lack the simplicity of the Japanese trees. So I've been to, I've been to China and visited a lot of older gardens. Yeah. And... I was in context, the bonsai, or is it called it in Chinese? Penjing. Penjing. The specimens did look beautiful because yeah. it's all about, I guess, the art of positioning too, about yeah. where they sit in often quite small landscapes. So it was beautiful. So the Japanese wouldn't put them in a landscape separate from the garden. So it would be only bonsai. So quite a different aesthetic. Right? Yeah, different aesthetic yeah. altogether. Yeah, how yeah. they deal with these things. Yeah. So there's a lot of 
Well, in fact, the Chinese, the Japanese, everybody who's ever done bonsai for centuries all have their own rules and regulations, it would seem. Do you, in fact, follow any of those, Craig? Or are you... A bit... Are you of the... The Japanese. Oh, which school? The Japanese school? I think so. Yeah. The reason for that, who knows? Historical. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, when we first started growing bonsai in Australia, that's who we learned from. Well, it's true, isn't it? It was the Japanese. We didn't even have entry into China back then. That's so. right. Yeah. Yeah. So back to our origin story, is there an understanding of where it actually did begin? Was it a Chinese or a Japanese technique? Or are they still spread? arguing? <laughs> They're probably still China arguing and, and, and is it relevant? But it, mm. it, it's people say China mm. and, and then to Japan, which yeah. is pretty much with most art forms, isn't it? Yeah. And, and certainly if you go to an ex ex exhibition in Japan, the trees will be in antique Chinese pots. Yeah. Mm. And they'll put them in the pots for the exhibition and then take them home and change the pot. We're going to get to pots because that's Yeah, that's all part of it. That is beautiful to my eye as well. But I guess for me, being the non-passionate outside observer, I guess versions of conifers seem to me what I most associate with bonsai. And this shape of this tree looks to me Archetypal bonsai. Is that the case? Are you using evergreens? No. All right. No. Yeah, shut down Ever, evergreen. evergreen and deciduous. And, and if, if you go to the exhibitions in Japan, they're always held in winter, mm. and that's because of the deciduous trees. So you see the form of the branch. You see the form of the tree, oh, and, and you, can, you can show off your, your skill and your work. And this one, what's the story of this one? How old would this one be? Uh, I pulled this up from the side of the road on a visit to Stephen's Nursery. <laughs> yeah. Really? You didn't buy it from me though. No, 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 no. no. Literally, you yeah. stopped well, it. I would have bought well, something. It was, yeah, it was just, you know, releasing it from a definite fate if it's on the side of the road. It's mm. Pinus radiata. Yeah, so it's just the classical oh, Pinus radiata. It's a weed. And if it had stayed where it was, it wouldn't still be alive. So yeah. this tree had a, had a second chance. The cracking on the bark takes about 20 years. Yeah. What a beautiful tree. All right, well, I think We'll go and start talking about pruning, care, and the types of plants you can use with some other examples. So yeah. I guess, Craig, you have to start at the beginning. What plants can you bonsai? And maybe, what is the whole point of it? Is it to create a version of a mature tree in miniature? Is that the point of bonsai? It's the point of, the idea is to make a tree look natural in miniature. Right. Yeah, so, so you don't, you know, a lot of people, they look for something that's odd about the tree. We don't want oddities, we want normality. Right. Yeah. So if you look at an ancient tree... Normality, I mean, in yeah. context, I guess. Yeah, yeah, and, it's, and I get where Craig's coming from. Mm. Um, if you look at an old tree, it mm. will be gnarly, it will have gaps in between the canopy, mm. its foliage size will be in context to the size of the tree, so its leaves yeah. will look small. So the whole thing has to be balanced mm. and look as much as possible like an ancient tree. That's right, but also an old tree will have a fine, fine ramification of branches. Yeah. So lots of twigs, right? which is what, what you're looking for, and, and a rounded crown. Okay, Yeah. which I guess to my ears doesn't limit your choice somewhat, but here, this looks like a Banksia, which is an Australian native. So is it, it is. It indeed it is. It's Banksia integrifolia, which once would have been right around the Port Phillip. Yeah, not quite local to here, but mm. certainly yeah. local to Victoria. This tree is obviously quite an old one. Yeah. So this came into your collection as an already grown one because you're far too young. It is. <laughs> it did. I, I, it's a tree I bought. I bought it in 1994. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it was in a pot like that size. Now, I'm assuming that this tree has flowered. I don't flower it. So you don't even let it flower? No, if not, it not interested. If it flower though, we're talking about the, you know, keeping things in scale. Yeah. Flowers aren't going to be in scale, are they? If flowers and fruit you can't reduce. Yeah. Ah, so if you let it bloom, the it'll have great full size Banksia flowers. Ridiculous. That's yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. So uh, you it, don't it, actually let it bloom. So we are we are here. I'm just going to be the devil's advocate. We are challenging normality here because you're not letting it bloom, and if you did, it would look wildly out of proportion. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. So we agree with you completely. Okay. Yeah. All right. And yeah. and I mean, there's lots of plants that we don't let bloom. Yeah. You know, buxus pruning them always they yeah. never flower yeah okay yeah all right yeah, uh, yeah. see <laughs> pruning pruning a bonsai is basically the banks of your garden. fine uh, uh pruning a bonsai is basically the same as pruning anything else as craig mm. said you know we prune box hedge for a specific aesthetic so yeah. what we want the plant to do i mean gardening is not about the natural world gardening right. is about 
manipulating yeah, manipulating the world yeah. and perhaps giving a a man-made impression of the natural world okay. yeah. so yeah uh, there's nothing different in bonsai that you wouldn't talk about say pruning your apple trees mm. or trimming your hedges mm. or your topiary in the garden mm. it's basically the same that's thing. right yeah and the the lichen on the on the trunk and the moss it's absolutely stunning but i guess obviously this is an australian native tree. it is so in terms of the development of bonsai, I suppose there's like a classical tradition. And then in the modern world, when people started bonsaiing all around the world using local species, has that changed how bonsai um, is sort of thought of or even how it occurs in the homelands of sort of China and Japan where bonsai started? It hasn't changed it in the East. No, but, so but it's still very classic. Yeah, but here you would have a school of people who say they are growing trees in the Australian style. Oh, and, is and the then you would have, oh yeah. What's and, the Australian style? Well, they use native trees. And, Loose yeah, wild. not something I've ever subscribed to. Mm. And are uh, Japanese and Chinese bonsaiers using to them exotic species like Australian natives or Californian natives? Or? Japanese only use their own natives. The Europeans are using a lot of their own natives now, as are the Americans. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess another question is, can you bonsai anything? It I depends mean, on the foliage type and the growth habit. Mm. Absolutely, you can, mm. but, uh, but will the, it be the, a good bond? Yes, exactly. <laughs> the, the success is going to depend on the the, the attributes of the plant. Yeah. What the Japanese do with with, with bonsai wisteria is that they style them in a way which is going to display the flowers. Oh, yeah. They put them out when they're in flower, and then the rest of the year they're around behind the house. You've got a couple of blooming specimens, so let's go and look at those. Because when do you let something bloom, and when do you not let something bloom? That is the question. Yeah. <laughs> right. I see something in bloom. Indeed, Forsythia suspensa. Forsythia. Is that right, Stephen? It's very likely suspensa, although it's been pruned and, and shaped in such a way now that it's actually a little hard to tell. <laughs> yeah. So here's the thing, because we were just talking about can anything be bonsai? I wouldn't have thought a Forsythia lent itself to it, because it's quite a leggy shrub, isn't it? They're, they're one of those things that you bring out when they're in flower and put aside when they're not. Mm. Always grown in the clump style. But the flowers are actually of a size that sort of work, so they're not too big. So this is the size the flower would be on a full size plant? Yes. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. The, the flower hasn't changed. Yeah. I'm assuming the foliage has reduced a little bit or not? Maybe, so. but not so much. Yeah. But then it's, look, it's not something I strive to achieve yeah. because it's about the flowering period. But it is a very vigorous growing plant naturally. Lots of pruning. I was going to say, this wouldn't be a once a year job to keep this in order. They stop growing quite early. Yeah. You know, they might grow up until mid-January yeah, and then right. they stop. Mm -hmm. Which is midsummer in Australia in yeah. the Southern Hemisphere. We'll get to pruning. Uh, we were talking about the Banksia, which does have dramatic, beautiful flowers, but you choose not to let that bloom. Obviously, these flowers proportionally are smaller. And is that the basis of the decision, the size of the flower? The, the Banksia is an exception. Mm. I mean, most flowering plants, you would let them flower. Mm. Yep. But having said that, generally it's the secondary consideration. Mm. So like if you are, for example, growing azalea as bonsai, mm. then you should be able to exhibit the azalea out of flower. Mm -hmm. So it also has a good structure. And I also notice, obviously, you've got a very butter yellow flower on a cobalt blue dish. Is that part of the whole decision and aesthetic process? A absolutely. Yeah. I guess the other thing that you can see so clearly on this, which is perhaps something that doesn't ring my aesthetic bell, yeah. is the wiring. Which yep. is a necessity. That's our paintbrush. Mm. So talk us through, what is what is it for, when do you do it and why? It's for styling. Mm. You do it when the tree needs styling mm. and you take it off before it starts to dig in. When you say styling, you mean to create all these sort of they're, they're, amazing forms? They're all manufactured. Mm. They're all manufactured with wire, mm. every single one. Yeah. I'm going to shimmy the camera over here, which is very technical. Yeah. You can so, see all the wiring that's involved in that. Firstly, what type of plant is this? Trident maple, so Acer bergerianum. Oh, it's growing on a rock. Yes, yes. there's a rock underneath it. You, you put the tree on the rock yeah. when it's young and when its roots are like cotton. Mm. so that you can drape them over the rock and then hold them in place with clay yeah, and then bury the whole lot. Mm. Yeah. yeah, so the roots have to get established before lower, so yeah. you can't just expose the whole root system of a new plant. Yeah. Hang on, so if you plant it on the rock, then you cover it, let you it mature, bury it, that's right. And then you uncover it when you think the roots... Yeah, when they're woody. Yeah. 
Wow. Okay. And and you you would take it out of the pot and and reattach the roots, as in push them in against the rock yeah. while you're growing it. Right. Yeah. Okay, that's extraordinary. So an aesthetic choice is, of course, the rock choice. Absolutely. This is a beautiful rock. It is. It's got lovely form and shape. Yeah. It's, yeah. Got, it's got real character about it. Yeah. And then the ceramics. So let's talk about ceramics. Where do all these ceramics come from? I'm presuming China and Japan. Mostly Japan. Mm. Yep. The Chinese used to make beautiful pots. Beautiful pots. These days, not so much. Mm. They're mass produced. Right. Yep. So, so there's three grades of Japanese pots, basically. This is the, the cheaper end of the scale, where liquid clay is poured into a mould. So this is quite a good quality Japanese pot, but not handmade. So it would be press moulded with firm clay into a mould. So this is a handmade pot. So the clay is actually rolled out with a rolling pin as such, and then put together and signed. And, and you can see the beautiful detail. You can see the feet. You can see the beading around here. The glaze is fantastic. It, it, it also needs to be mentioned that the value of pots increases with age. So once they get some patina, they're worth more than a brand new one. On a, in a practical sense, we might mention the wire and exactly what you're using. It's aluminium wire. It, it used to be copper wire, but nowadays it's aluminium. So you were saying you leave it on until it starts to dig in. I mean, how long would that be? Would it depend on the tree? On Depends the on the species entirely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So it's a, it's a watch and act. Yeah, that's right. Thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well. And it's something which which when you when you start out growing bonsai, it is very time consuming but as you get better at it, it can be quite quick right and it doesn't decrease as the tree gets older it increases really yeah yeah this well that that's actually something we probably should now that craig has opened that door well, we should talk about yes the time involved in looking after a collection i mean there's mm. time involved in getting a tree up to a stage where you think it's a good bonsai mm. so that can take years or decades or in some places it would seem centuries you can't just walk away from these things so yeah. how much time do you spend looking after your collection it varies from season to season yeah. now it's coming into full-on work mode yeah. so this is spring in it, australia yeah because most of my collection's deciduous so i spend the summer working the foliage uh -huh. trying to create twigs and i guess the other vulgar question about time stephen yes is money is money yes exactly and if Craig is going to spend 20 years creating a uh, respectable a bonsai. Right. I guess that's something that uh, frightens people a little bit. I mean, I've always been of the school, not that I'm a bonsai grower, but I've always been of the belief that if you're going to grow bonsais, you certainly need to know about them. You need to know how to do it, but you should also create your own. Buying a pre-made bonsai in some ways mm. is like buying a painting as opposed to painting a picture of your own. I disagree with that entirely. Good, off you go then, yeah. that's fabulous. If you buy a painting, you hang it on the wall and do nothing. Well, and true. look at it. If you buy a bonsai, the work never stops. Mm. And, and you can change it. You can, go, you can go and buy a bonsai from one of the great masters in Japan and completely change it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, of course, because what does a master know? Yeah. yeah. If, if I was living in Japan, I would go out and buy a tree which had been grown by professionals for 20 years, starter stock. Starter stock. Yeah. Really? Yeah. <laughs> and, and I'd go from there. I wouldn't be growing my own trees. They, Somebody uh, else does that. In the Australian school, do you start from seedlings? I do. Yeah. But the reason I do that is because most Australians don't know how to grow them. Mm. So you can't get a well-grown exactly. bonsai. Yeah. Right. So, so most of my trees are grown from seed or cutting. Right. And do you go out and look for the deformed one? That's that's always the question. No, I'm not into deformity. Yeah, yeah. So because I regularly get people, I assume quite often, amateur bonsai enthusiasts yeah. who come into my nursery and they're looking for the root-bound scruffy thing that I've got in the back corner Which somewhere. Which you happily sell them. Yeah, yeah. And they think that's the way to find their bonsai. When you buy bonsai that has been grown for the nursery industry, you buy a tree which has problems in the roots. Mm. And the reason for that is the nurseryman strikes a cutting, he puts it in a tube, and then he moves it from the tube to the next pot, just yep. tickling up the outside, and then the next size, and then the next size, and underneath it you have this. Yeah. But you want that. So hence starting off with a oh. young plant. So, so if, if you look, say, at the tree behind you, mm. and you see the flare, 
All right, I, let's let's show everyone what we're talking about. I'm going to very cunningly move yeah. the camera. And we'll walk in, so you can see the flare of the trunk. So you're not going to get that on a scruffy root-bound potted plant. In the no, nest. you're not. This is cutting grown, mm. and so it, it has had radial roots for its entire existence. And what those radial roots will do is that they pull the base out as the tree's growing. And so you get that lovely settled feeling in the pot. I mean, it looks as though it's sitting there nicely and it's not going to fall over. Mm. So Craig, one of the things that strikes me is just how you displayed everything here on sort of columns and pedestals. Is this a typical way of displaying bonsai? It is. It is. And, and, and one of the reasons I do this is because if you put them on a bench, for example, that, yeah. you always overcrowd. <laughs> uh, yes, because the space is there and yeah, you push them in. That's one right. One pedestal, one pot. One pedestal, one pot. And I can have the luxury of doing that because I've been through the process of growing many trees and now I've culled it down to a few. And is this a particular school of display? Is this Chinese, Japanese, Korean? What you find with the Japanese is that they will set up an area that is only for displaying bonsai. Like this? Yeah. Right. More so than this because it'll have big fences around it so that you don't see the rest of the world. Right, everything yeah. miniature. Yeah, you can yeah. come down to the size of your trees. Mm. They are phenomenally labour intensive. So we are saying this isn't for the low maintenance garden lovers. Not for it, me. It, it depends entirely what you want them for. Yeah. I mean, if you want to grow good bonsai, then you have to put an awful lot of work into them. But if you want something that's perhaps not so good and you're happy with that, go for it. Yeah. Well, I think now it's time to dive into some specifics. The pruning, the roots, the watering, and the feeding. Yep. Let's go. All right, Craig, let's talk food. Yep. What are these blue dots? Fertilizer. There you go. It's a quick fix, that one. Yeah. Not the ideal. Oh, yeah. why? Normally, I'd feed them organic fertilizers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's make that crystal clear poo. Yep. Yep. The point is that people need to understand about bonsais is you're not actually maltreating the plant. You're not actually trying to keep it stunted by completely underfeeding and under caring for it. You're actually trying to keep it in prime health. Absolutely. And yeah. a, tree, a tree can't improve and they should improve constantly throughout yeah. their life mm. unless it's growing. Mm. It has to be growing to improve. Over the, over the summer period, you know, starting January, I would feed them once a week with liquid fertiliser and have the solid fertilisers as well. Wowza. You see, they're, they're leading the good life. They're they not, are. They're not these poor, mistreated things that so many people seem to think a bonsai is. Yeah. So, so different species have a different feeding regime. Yeah. So for the deciduous species, you don't feed them too much in the spring mm -hmm. because then you get long internodes and big leaves. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So once the spring growth start to settle down, then you start feeding them. Mm -hmm. And the feeding really ramps up in the autumn and early winter mm -hmm. because that's when they're setting their buds for next year's growth. Uh -huh. Ah, yeah. and then obviously native plants they grow all year round. Right, right, yeah. right. And actually, just for everyone's interest, this looks like an elm, is it? It's corky bark form of the Chinese elm. Mm. So, Ulmus parvifolia suberosa. But that's almost cheating, isn't it? Because it naturally gets the corky bark. It does. <laughs> well, I don't know about cheating. But yeah. I grow these from root cuttings, and if you grow them from root cuttings, the bark cracks very early. Well, let's go and look more at your potting and pruning technique. All right. Good. Yep. So, this is an imprecisely growing it tree. It doesn't look actually all that great. And it's not that so, great. Yeah. yeah. It's got a big, thick, straight trunk on it. So how was this originally grown? It was grown in the ground yeah. and it was allowed to just grow freely. So it would have been quite a large plant. Would have been quite a large plant and then it was whacked off at the top. Yeah. Yep. Now that's getting hollow in there. Is it that is. a problem? No, <laughs> look, I don't think so. I think I'll get it to cover over. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So the plan is to cover it over. Absolutely. Not to engage with that hollow. No, no, no. Now, this sort of strikes me as interesting because you've got these branches sticking out here, which are obviously not being pruned or shaped or anything done with them. What's the purpose? So they're what we call sacrifice branches. Uh -oh. So a sacrifice, <laughs> a sacrifice branch will thicken everything that's below it. Oh, really? So if you allow these branches just to run yeah. and to grow out, then I can get this base to flare out a bit. Oh, so you and get in, that sort of classical look to it. That's yeah. right, yeah. And that will sort of perhaps negate the thickness and the lack of taper in the rest of the tree. 
so these are allowed to get some vigor to them. So yeah. that then gets the taper happening at the bottom. So I'm assuming right. that in time, these will, by They'll the name, be removed. They That's will right. be removed. So yeah. they will be sacrificed yeah. in due time. Yeah. So the final product that you're trying to create here? A formal upright deciduous tree ah, yes. with a nice flared base. Yep. Yeah. All right. So that's the aim long term. Yeah. How long have you been working on this tree now? Five, six years. So it came to me as a, yeah. as a well. Sold as a bonsai? Sold as a bonsai, yeah. yeah. Right. But yeah. I've grown every branch. I mean, I cut all the branches off it straight away. Yeah. All right. So yeah. you've had it five or six years. How long do you think it will be before you... Well, you're never satisfied, I guess, because it's yeah. always changing. But how long do you think it'll be before you think you've got something that's a really presentable bonsai? Another 10 years, oh. 15 maybe. <laughs> so you do have to hang around for these things. It's the same process as growing a tree in the garden. Yeah. Well, it is, I guess. I try and encourage my customers to not think about the final size of what they're planting, but enjoy the process of that's growing right. it. Yeah. And I guess it's the same. Yeah. Have you any sense of when you're likely to take these limbs off? It will be dependent, I guess, on what happens below. So When I'm satisfied with what's below them, yeah. then I'll cut them off. I, right. The times frames, I don't know. But if you look at this one here, this is one that I've grown and field grown. Yeah. And you can see the difference. Yes, well, this has got the sort of uh, almost straight trunk with almost no taper. Yeah. And that's got a huge bowl to the base of the tree. That's so. right, and big scars down low. You know, yeah. this one's rolled over, yeah. but there's another one here that hasn't rolled over. And, and when you say rolled over, you mean it hasn't grown over the, yeah, that's the, right. the actual hole in yeah. the trunk. So there's a sacrifice branches, even when you're field growing them, are down low on the tree. Yeah. And so the combination of a radial root system and a sacrifice branch pulls the base out. Yeah. Well, see, I'm learning something every day that I didn't know about, so isn't that fantastic? All right. I think it's time we go off and have a look at how you deal with the bottom bit of your bonsai yep. plants. All right, we're in the potting shed, Stephen. Yes. It's the man cave. Yes. The man cave. <laughs> Where it all happens. What do you pot them in? What's the medium yeah. you use? Let's right? start with potting. Yeah. So, so this is, uh, uh, the scale would be three to six mil, mm -hmm. and it's a combination of pine bark, so the fine orchid mix. And what's the other, other material? Hummus. And is that it? Yep. That's, That's it. it. That's so everything, what... every species? Yep. Even the Australian natives? Yep. Well, they, they wouldn't object to that. The, 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 the open mix means that you can feed heavily and it doesn't retain, so it just runs through all the time. Which brings us to the watering issue, though, because the obverse of that is it will dry out quickly. No, it doesn't. It doesn't dry out any more quickly than any normal potting mix. And I think the reason for that is because if you have the components of the potting mix roughly the same size, mm. then you have a lot of spaces in the pot, mm. and those spaces oh, yeah, fill yeah. with water. Mm -hmm. And just in terms of the, the mix, is it 50-50 or is it...? Roughly. Right. As many growers as you talk to about potting mix. Yeah, they'll have their own. Everyone will have their own oh, okay. own story. This is the Craig. It is. Yeah, this is the Craig Wilson specific yeah. Um, yeah. potting mix, which obviously works for him. And I guess potting mixes will vary not just for personal taste, but climatically. So in different yeah. climates, you would adapt a potting mix that's going to suit for your specific climates. Mm. Well, I suppose there are bonsai societies, I mean, in every region. So if you were coming to this raw, as it were, as an amateur, the easiest thing to do would be to join a club, join a club. And find yeah. experts and figure yeah. out what people in your region are doing yeah. in terms of the material. So when I first started growing bonsai, th there was no information and the information that we had was incorrect. Yeah. These days, you can jump onto YouTube and f find out... Yeah, like our station. <laughs> ...anything you want to know. Yeah. As long as you understand the nature of the person that you're learning from, because there's a lot of rubbish too. Yeah. Mm. Now, the next obvious question then, I guess, you've got the material, is how often do you repot? So some of those specimens we saw in your display area, how often would you need to repot those? So last year I repotted one of the big radiatas, pines, and that would be the first time in 10 years. So this isn't an annual event usually? This is so dependent on species and age of trees. There's a number of variables. For example, if you were growing privet, mm. you'd probably repot them twice a year. Mm. Yeah, because they're a vigorous, quick-growing yeah. thing and they get a vigorous root. Yeah. yeah. But with the deciduous trees, look, annually, once every two years. Mm. Yeah. Okay. The next step then is we've got next to you a plant that is, unbeknownst to it, about to succumb to bonsai. Well, it has been for a while. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's been led to this. It's pre-bonsai. <laughs> sacrificial. We have sacrificial lambs, sacrificial branches. 
So let's take a closer look at this and what you're going to do. So Stephen, this is Ficus rubiginosa. Ah, so it's one of our native it's, figs. It is, and it's yeah. Port Jackson fig. And then the reason we select that species is because the leaf size reduces. Ah, so with your pruning and so forth, you will get that instead of having these great big heavy leaves on it, you'll get them down to about what size do you reckon you will be happy with? Smaller than that. So we're getting down to a leaf that small, which is quite remarkable when you can see yeah. what a leaf can do. So that will be in balance with that. Yeah. All right. So, so when you're growing a tree from scratch, it's like building a house. You start at the bottom and work up. Uh-huh. Sounds yep. logical. So yep. you don't try and grow the whole lot at once. Yeah. Yep. So you just leave the top and yep. that will all be sacrificed in due course. That's right. Uh, and you're now building a bit of size to the base. That's so right. That's where you're going. And root pruning will do that for you? Yeah, uh, root pruning and growing. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, so you, you work on this bit and then you work on that bit and then you work on that bit. You work your way up the tree. Right. All right, so I guess the next thing is for us to... Um, Upend it. Yes, disrobe it so that we can... Dive. What you want on a bonsai is for that with those woody roots to be the only part of the root system that's wood. Mm -hmm. Everything below the surface is fibre or feeding roots. So that's what the plant's going to live off. The aesthetics of the woody roots are what you're aiming for. That's right. But then everything else underground is paddling like a duck. And feeding furiously. Yeah. yeah. All right, so well, fibrous root system. Do you want me to take it out of the pot? I'd well, love you to. Oh, here we go. Now that sort of surprises me because it's in a it's in the mix that you would use for a bonsai, so it's yeah. adjusted to the mix. Yeah. And it isn't running around with a mad pile of root system in the pot because the size of the plant. If I had that as a nursery plant, I would assume it would be almost root bound by now. I repotted it um, December last year. All right. So. Oh, Keeps dates and everything. Yeah. How old oh, no. is that? 21, December 21. I would have thought it would have had a more congested root system by this point, but there you go. Yeah. So you now just sort of clean out the roots. That's right. And close them all. So you're not at this stage pulling anything off or anything. Not yet. Just, just opening up the root system, getting rid of all the potting mix. So when you're repotting a tree, it's not only about Cutting the roots, it's yep. also about changing the potting mix. Yeah. Because old potting mix is not good. Well, the pine bark would break down over a period. That's time, right. Wouldn't it? Yep. So you, you'd end up with it getting a bit gluggy. Yeah. Uh, I guess the pumice doesn't, though. So no, the pumice. Can you reuse? Absolutely. Good. Glad yep. to hear that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what I do is that I reuse for things which are less important. Ah. Yeah. Dry it out. Yeah. Sieve it, and use it for alpine plants, seed raising, ah. whatever. Good. So it's yep. not wasted. So what I wanted to get rid of first is the roots that are coming down. Can you see that base? Yeah. Oh yes, you can see the base of the plant there. So you're getting rid of any roots that are going in a downward direction. That's right. I want them all to come out so that they pull the base out. Generally with the bonsai I do the kill or cure root prune when yeah. they're young. Oh, right. And then after that, it's easy. Yeah, and and some, of the old, the yeah, some of the old trees up there, it's a five minute operation. Yeah. And you just trim around the edge a bit. All oh, right. So the, the structure of the roots will then stay in place, yep. basically. That's right. And right. all nice. See how there's no tangles. So we go over and just take out some of these ones that are starting to form a woody base, like these. Yeah. That's fascinating that it's the woody roots you need to avoid forming. And you're encouraging fibrous roots, which are seeking out nutrients and moisture. Yeah, they're the feeding exactly. roots. Exactly. Yeah, you want you want the whole pot to be full of feeding roots. Yeah. Right. This is troubling me a bit. See, this is nice. Yeah. And this is a bit of a disaster. Uh, so it's got a bit of rot in it. Yeah, and it's just... So we're going to get rid of it all together. That's right. Is that an aesthetic choice? Aesthetic choice. Yeah. And you see we have roots there that'll... Yeah, they'll move around. Move around and take yeah. up the space. All right, so we've, we've reduced the root size. Yeah. Now, in normal nursery practice, we've done that. We would then immediately prune the top. Yeah, that's right. But that's, that, you know, just like that. So that's all you're doing at this stage. Yeah. You're not, you're not trying to shape your bonsai at the moment. No, so all, I'm, all I'm considering is, is, is this section. Right. Yeah. So the branches come later. 
the branches come later. The aesthetic and the care. And, and that is with broadleafed evergreens and deciduous trees, but not with conifers. With conifers, you need to retain branching. Yeah, yeah, because once you take branching away from conifers, Can't they, put don't, it back. Yeah, they don't reshoot as well. Yeah. So uh, uh, once it's done, it's done. I'll just do a bit more there. And then you'll put this just back into the same sort of nurse pot? It won't It'll go in, there. yeah. These, these are orchid pots. All right, so let's just review what's happened here. So in my hands, I've got basically most of the root system that's been removed. Yep. So you can see how much root systems come off this ficus. And we can have a look at the, the actual plate of the plant or the base of the plant and how those roots now that are left are all... Let's lift it up a little bit though so that we can see it. So you can see the roots are all sort of radiating out in a starfish type pattern. And so those will all still be down anchored in the ground. So they'll be feeding the plant once it's replanted. Yep. So, so basically what you're doing is developing a structure which is capable of living in a pot for a very long time. Yeah, so this is all part of the, the thing. So it's not starving it, it's not root bounding it, it's in fact going almost the opposite way. Yeah, now. yeah. So, and it's also, you know, there's it, nothing in bonsai which has only one purpose. Yeah. And, and also you find that the roots and the branches of a tree will follow each other. Mm -hmm. So if you have a nice flowing root system coming out, then the branches have a tendency to follow that root system. Uh, if so you have strong roots coming underneath, then you get strong growth oh, yeah, going so you up. you get a, a, a more a yep. apical growth That's right. the tree. And you see that in the garden. If you see a tree with a great big root on one side, there'll be a big branch above it. Yeah. So everything balances. See, these are things we learn from these skills that we may not actually, well, it might be there in the back of your mind, but it's not something that you really think about when you're gardening in general. So yeah, yeah Bonsai's got a lot to teach us. All right, Craig, so now let's get on to repotting. All right, well, well this can be really well, quick. That's just to tie the tree into the pot. So this is just your usual wire that you use for your bonsai it work. Is. Yeah. That will hold the tree up because yeah. obviously with the small root system that we've now created, it's going to struggle to sort of That's stay right. in place. So it needs to be tied into place. Why is this going into a plastic pot at this point? Because it's growing on. Yeah. This isn't a bonsai. It's not a bonsai. It's pre-bonsai. Yeah. Right. So you don't go and waste your good pots on this plant at this point. Now, I know this is a ridiculous sort of question. but no, there is when, no ridiculous when question. When would you, from today, when would this be perhaps ready to go into a terracotta ceramic pot? I mean, I could do that now if I wanted to by making it a smaller tree. Yeah. You know, so taking it off there. So that it's, it's what they call a, a chuhin, chuhin size, 20 centimetres. Mm -hmm. I prefer a little bit bigger. I go 30, so perhaps another five years. Right. Yeah. Uh, just a mere nothing, really, when you think about it in the I scheme of things. Yes, yeah. that's right. So you've put your wire in place, so that's ready to go. Yeah. So you make a mound like that. All right, so the, the root system will then sit over Drape the Drape over the mound. Right. So and then you just put the tree over the top of it. And, and you notice that there's no tangles. Yes, everything is going out and Everything down. is going out and down. And you're yeah. trying to reinstate it at more or less the same level it was? Yeah. So you just fill it up to where it was before? Roughly. Roughly. It doesn't have to be too exact, as long as all the roots are properly buried. That's right. And that's when the wire perhaps comes so in. The wire place. comes on now. Yeah, yeah. So you use that to just sort of tie it all down to its pot. Yeah, and then we get a pair of pliers. And you lift and twist. All right. So quite obviously there's no point in tamping down the potting mix or anything. It's unnecessary, but if, if you have a tree that has a more complex root base, then you uh, would need to do that. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I guess the next thing is the usual thing you would do, you would water it in. Exactly. Uh, All right, so we've potted, we'd water, and what about feeding? Because of the species and because there's a lot of fibrous roots there, mm -hmm. and I would put some liquid fertilizer in the water. So you'd water it and feed it but that, that, Yeah, that, that would be dependent on what you're dealing with, on the yep. species you're dealing with and the time of year. Yeah. Yep. So, all right, well, and a fig being evergreen and basically always in growth, yep. um, yeah, I guess that makes logical sense. So yep. you would feed it with a liquid feed, uh, and later on you'd give it manure or whatever. Exactly, and liquid feed, yep. always liquid feed. All right, so we've basically done it. Is there anything else you would do to that plant just at this point, or you would just leave it for another year or whatever? Well, I'll do a bit of pruning yeah. to, to, to thin it out and to make sure that nothing gets too dominant. Yeah. Um, so that we don't end up with big scars on the top of the tree. Mm -hmm. But other than that, no, it's just growing on. Well, 
bonsai. Uh, can I just say, from, you know, I was a little bit cynical, Craig. Apologies. No, 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 that's fine. I'm used to it. <laughs> but that was really fascinating, seeing that root system mm. and understanding that it's the woody roots you're cutting off and not allowing to develop, but encouraging the fibrous roots, yep. which gives the plant all its nutrients and water. Yeah, I so, get it now. Yeah, so you're not massacring off or, woody root or every being year. mean to your yes. plant. You're actually managing it and looking after it beautifully. I am disappointed, though, that you don't have artisanal Japanese bonsai tools <laughs> <laughs> yeah. handed yeah. down from four generations. Yeah, yeah. No, those things don't happen here so often. But Craig, thank you so much for your time and for going through this. It's a pleasure. Yeah. You know my thoughts, but I, I may be teetering on conversion. The yeah, conversion well, I'm, therapy works. I'm, I'm hoping it has because uh, I find it a fascinating and I just wish I had more time to actually play with these sorts of things. It, uh, it, it, is, in, it is something that you need to understand in yeah. depth. Mm. Yeah, and, and usually what I say to people when they say to me it's cruel, I say that if you're concerned about the welfare of trees, then go to the Erinundra Plateau yeah. and, and protest about the logging of old growth forests. Yeah, that's far more important, <laughs> in fact. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I think it's important to understand Gentiana Nursery, which is where we are now, is a commercial nursery that specialises in bulbs and perennials. Alpine. Alpine plants yeah. and unusual plants. Not bonsai. No. So, no. viewers, you cannot come and buy bonsai from Craig. Yeah. And no. don't come and ask me to see the collection, please. No, no so it's all go. private and we've been very fortunate to be allowed into Craig's inner sanctum. So, uh, thank you very much for showing us pleasure. and our viewers. But yes, it is not open to the public and not something anyone mm -hmm. can see. But you do have a website for your general um, alpines, perennials and bulbs. I do. We'll put the link below. Yes. Now, if you want to know what we're doing next week, hit subscribe. We post every Friday. Yes. And don't forget, too, that we do our Monday shorts. So if you've got a question that you'd like me to answer in less than 60 seconds, pop it in the comments column below. Give me context on where you're from and we'll see if we can answer your question uh, at some point in the next few weeks. So we look forward to seeing you next week. Bye all. Bye bye.